All right. Hi everyone, and welcome to my stream. Um, I'm going to be. This is Ian Boyd with the NC SU Libraries, um, where I work in learning spaces and services. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to be doing a stream of a continuing stream of um, my work with the libraries. And sorry, I'm just uh, distracted because I'm trying to make sure that my stream is working. One second. I'm gonna throw this over here. So we should be good. Okay, I'm just making sure. Finding my chat and everything. I think my biggest problem is I'm not watching live and it's throwing me off. One second, so I think we're good. Just making sure my settings are correct. And I'm sorry for the late start, but I just want to make sure that I have everything locked in. Cool. All right, cool. I think we're good. I think we're good. I think I'm, I'm set and ready to go. Just making sure everything was working, and it looks like it is. So that's good. I got my chat popped up. All right, cool. So we can get underway. All right, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about when I was doing my introduction, I kind of got cut off, but um, basically I'm Ian Boyd. I am a library specialist. I'm employed by NCSU Libraries, where I work with the Makerspace, uh, the Innovation Studio, and I help with the VR Lab some as well. Um, basically what I'm doing today is I'm exploring this new, not new necessarily, but it's a new tool to us that we're kind of interested in using called Clara.io, which is a browser-based modeling tool um, basically you know and it's a browser-based surface modeler so you know along the same lines as blender which is a very big open source 3d modeling software or um, something like maya or 3ds max or modo or cinema 4d um, any of these like modeling packages that work in a surface space unlike uh, cad you know like autocad or solidworks or fusion 360 um, and I can kind of talk about while I stream as like what the advantages of surface modeling are, you know, versus uh, CAD modelers or solid modelers, but I'm just going to kind of get underway and get back to the project uh, that we had at hand. One second. Just making sure. Okay, there we go. Cool. All right, cool. I think I am here live now. All right, <laughs> just making sure. I just want to make sure I can follow along with my stream and especially uh, keep up with the chat as I go. Okay, but I think we're good. If you have asked any questions and I've missed them, uh, be sure to just retype them in the chat because I've just been getting everything up and running. All right, so what I've got here is this chair I was working on. It's a kind of a continuation from last uh, stream that I was doing, and you can kind of see how the base is coming together. And I've kind of been blocking out uh, some render shots of it as we go, but I've got some more work to do. So I'm just going to kind of setting up my space right now. There we are. I'm getting my things all worked out. Okay, cool. That looks good to me. Okay. All right, so everything is set up. What I was working on last time was I was developing the base for this chair seat. And I was kind of talking about how when you're doing something like this, you don't want it to be um, just a square, if you can help it. You want to kind of like put in some variation in the thickness and thinness of it as you work. So right now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of blocking in these shapes. So what I can do is grab these vertices. If you've come to any of my streams, because I teach a lot of uh, different 3D design tools, uh, you'll know that like I'm always like block in, block it in, block it in. Start small and then work up to you know your final shape. But right now I'm just going through because I don't want this to just be like a square seat because squares are boring. You go on. I think it could also use some work from the front. I think I'm going to taper it out more towards the back, kind of flare it. So we'll do this in this top down view. So yeah, what I'm thinking of right now is just the kind of the overall silhouette of the of the object. And I'm just thinking about like how I want it, you know, to kind of look 
once we're finished and I might flare these back out some more and you can always add more um, vertices if you want to refine the shape a bit more but you don't have to is the thing again you can like block it out as much or as little as you need to squares are also uncomfortable for chairs absolutely they are you know you want something ergonomic you don't want to you don't want to sit on a, a block of wood so I think that's a good a good shape to start with. I got a little bit of that taper in the back, but I think we're okay. So we'll go from there. And what I was doing last time is the kind of modeling technique um, I'm using is uh, something called subdivision modeling or sub D modeling, and it's not really something that uh, is like outlined in this process. It's just something that you can use in like pretty much any um, surface modeler where basically what you're doing is you have a basic mesh shape, something like this chair right here, the seat I'm working on. Uh, hold on one second, I can actually illustrate this a lot cleaner if I do this. Oops. So go away. All right, now we just have the seat to concentrate on. Um, basically what you're doing is you're taking a mesh, in this case this chair seat, and you are applying a mesh smooth modifier to it or you're subdividing the mesh and what that's going to do I'll go ahead and click here for you is all of a sudden you're gonna average all of those um, polygons you had you're gonna you're gonna intersect them like you're gonna uh, the real the real thing is you're gonna quadrilate them you're gonna turn one quad into four quads and that's going to kind of give you the difference here. So you see I have these one, two, three, four quads right here. If I use a mesh smooth, it's going to divide each of those up into one, two, three, four. You use a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and even back here it's a one, two, three, four. And it's averaging the distance uh, between those quads. So like because you know these are these uh, vertices are a lot closer. Let me break it down. Because these vertices are a lot closer together than you know say these vertices there's gonna be um, more quads like put in over here than there are like say in the middle right here. There's still gonna be kind of a big gap. And you can you kind of tweak this algorithm to your advantage by inserting something called uh, edge loops or holding loops. So what I've kind of been doing here is I've kind of been uh, taking my model and I've kind of been finding out where I need to put in these holding loops and I've kind of been building them in right now. So what this looks like is if I draw this and I'm gonna do a cut plane operation. Let me go to my top down view because it'll make it so much easier. If I do a cut, uh, cut plane operation right here. You got it, come on. There we go. Basically generate this plane. Uh, I like to zero out the rotation so I've got something straight. And then I basically collapse it so what I've done is I've put in a new edge loop on here. Uh, and what this is going to do is if I move it over, and I'm going to go ahead and do that. So if I take this edge loop and I slide it right over to the edge, we're going to do this for each of them. We're going to kind of try to maintain the thickness between these two sides. So we're going to kind of follow the edge cleanly like this. So if I do this and put this edge loop in here, take a look at what happens if I go ahead and subdivide this mesh again. So before I did this mesh smooth operation, and you saw that uh, you kind of have the two, the two sides right here, and I'll zoom out so you can actually see what happened. But you'll see that since I did this mesh smooth operation, now this side is being held, this hard edge is being held a lot more. I'll turn off the wireframe. And this is the edge that I have not yet put that hold loop in. So what it's doing right here is it's really holding that edge of the seat like I want it to. And I can put these in wherever I want it to have a hard edge and I don't want it to like smooth out all the detail that I've been working and building up. So I'm gonna go back and do that. And uh, let's see, let's see. Real fast, I can go grab all this stuff that I hid and bring it back in. Oops. We'll get rid of this chair seat, bring that in. 
And then we also want to bring these two. This is just good so I can show you like the full chair so you kind of get an idea of what's going on here. Oh yeah, I forgot I had a uh, low poly version that I just hid, which is totally fine. Make sure I just hide the right one. I think that's that one. Yeah, okay, we're good. So you can kind of see in the context right here that this side looks a lot more like the general chair shape we want to hold as opposed to this side, which is all kind of smoothed out and weird. And it's really pinched into a uh, kind of an unfortunate shape right here. So what we can do, <clears throat> so what we can do is go ahead and put the group loops, uh, the edge loops on everything that we need, and then really kind of get it going. And there's a couple ways you can add these. So right now I'm going to undo the uh, subdivide here. We'll walk it back. Yeah. I'm going to turn my wireframe back on. So I could do this another way too. Like I could um, let me go back to my tools, grab these faces right here and I could do an extrusion on them except actually well this was probably still works we'll say 0 for the length and then we'll scale it in so you're seeing what I'm doing here Maybe like that is I'm putting in kind of a hold edge for the inside uh, as opposed to the outside by just scaling everything in and then I can always go back in and clean this up manually so like I can go grab my vertices and I can push them up to where they need to go. Oh, something like that. Oh yeah, hold up. <clears throat> if you're using the scale tool to uh, clean up something like this, remember that you can't scale in three dimensions because you'll actually pull it inside the mesh. You actually should scale it in two. That was my bad. I should, I should remember things like this, but you know, we all slip up. And then this will keep it flush with the surface. Oops. This will keep it flush with the surface, and then I could go back and position those vertices like however they needed to be. But right now they're fine. So they could, you could use that to insert a hold edge as well. I'm just going to undo that extrude. Okay, cool. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to push this in. So we're going to switch back to vertices and move it. Um, I really am kind of liking Clara. Uh, there are some things that are different from other modelers, like I'm familiar with. Um, to give you just a little bit of background on kind of where I come from 3D design wise and my history with different 3D design applications is that I kind of started with Maya because that's where I started like to class was with it in school. Like that was my software of choice throughout, throughout my undergrad where I was working in 3D design and animation. Um, and then from there, uh, like I expanded more into CAD modelers as I got more into 3D printing. So if I ever do something weird or like I do a weird shortcut, like hold down my right mouse button for too long, it's because I'm like thinking about Maya shortcuts because it's still probably my surface modeler of choice. But I do like, um, I like Clear a lot. I like kind of the framework you have here. It's very robust for a browser surface modeler, like in a way that I haven't really seen one be in the past. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so I could do two things here. One is, is I could do another cut plane operation and I could just kind of like recreate what it looks like on the side, um, on the side by hand and eyeball it. Or I could do a cut plane operation in the exact middle of my mesh. And this is something I haven't tried actually yet. So I'm going to do this. So I'm going to do it roughly right here in the middle. And then I'm going to local my center, center my line right on the zero, zero 090, and then collapse it to create this edge loop now throughout the whole thing. And then I can actually just grab this whole side and I can delete it. And since that is deleted on the center origin, I can just grab my whole model, clone it as a copy. drag it over here, scale it. Let me see if I have a local scale. I have this transform. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for. So I'm scaling on the X it looks like. So what I can do is I could remember this number or try to eyeball 
like where the scale winds up. But since you already have the scale in place, just put a negative in front of it. Boom, perfect, okay. So I have this, you'll notice it looks kind of weird. And the reason for that is that the normals are flipped. Like if I went and looked inside here, it would look right. I think I can flip the normals inside of, yeah, I could always undo, I could, you know, like if, if I got in too deep, but I'm not that worried about it. I think, I think we're gonna be fine. Um, so I've got my stuff in here and I wanna flip these normals. Let me see, I think we've got a way to do this. Do, 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 selection UV mapping edit model normals what are you doing right here oh flip normals that's what I'm looking for oh look and it looks good again okay cool so like I said if I'm ever looking for an operation like yeah well thank you uh, thank you for saying it's looking great yeah it's not looking too bad I kind of like where it's at right now um, I think it's heading in the right direction or sometimes my stuff doesn't but here it is I think it's doing okay so I've got this right here. So I want to kind of use a snap. I also could probably just translate it to the center. Like, yeah, boom. And then take a look from my top down view. So I have two meshes right here and I want to combine them. So let's go mesh. Uh, maybe under object. Ooh, big transform or merge. Let's try this merge operation. Okay. And then if we applied a smooth to it at this point. Hmm, that actually looks really good. I'm wondering though, did it did it merge my center vertices? And then that's the question. Like let me put it in here. Um because just because like the merge went through like with a surface modeler um, you still kind of have to ask this question like let me try it let me try a weld operation real fast just to make sure so we're going to grab these two and we're going to do a weld so no it didn't and how you can tell is if you look over here uh, so I just saw in chat that we had a question if if this is free what's the business model here so basically what it is, is there's a version for free that has reduced um, cloud rendering capacity. Like you can still render out all your models like in Clara, but, um, but if you wanna use their like cloud storage uh, render farm services, you have to pay for it. So it seems like what it mainly does is keeps it like free for um, anyone who wants to use it as a learning tool or as a hobbyist. But if you were like a studio or someone who needed like the rendering power to actually, you know, create something like an animation or a product render, you might want to go opt for a paid version to get it in place. Um, so it seems to be pretty, pretty free friendly. There's also, I think, like cloud-based libraries of like uh, material types that they have. So like, if you don't want to build your own like uh, metal materials, you can opt in for their like default materials. They have a few in here that maybe I can show at some point, um, but. For the most part, it's yeah, like all the all the tools are free. It doesn't lock anything out of like the the production pipe, like the the modeling pipeline. So real fast. So kind of what I saw from here is that when you mouse over the vertices in the object, you're gonna see that I'm getting multiple vertices when I click over it, and it's because even though you don't model a lot of clouds, <laughs> see, no, it's good. It's hard to model clouds; they're so organic. I'll leave that up to the experts. Uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and just weld these together. Okay, what that's gonna do is it's gonna reduce my vertice count by one, and now that these are merged together. Um, this isn't really an issue now, like in the modeling, because you can't tell. But if you were to like try and 3D print something, you'd get uh, non-manifold geometry errors. Uh, and the reason for that would be because um, basically it sees these as not one whole object at that point. It sees it as two halves that are just like pushed together perfectly like on this uh, center origin. And it wouldn't be able to print because these two halves have no thickness by themselves. They're not a solid object. So I'm gonna do through here is I'm gonna go ahead and use this weld option. I'm gonna see if I can bypass it. Sometimes if you use a weld option, like in a surface modeler, it's just gonna weld every vertice together to a point. Catch a cloud and pin it to a 3D model. 
man, like if you uh, if you start using like the jargon to describe real world terms, I mean, it just gets confusing. It's jargon for a reason, right? Okay, so I'm gonna weld these together, and I'm just gonna see what happens here. So it looks like it did what I wanted it to, which is it just welded the points within um, a certain distance of each other, but I need to double check and see. Yeah, one of 50, one of 50, one of 50. Yeah, it looks like it went fine. So what happens sometimes is that most weld options will give you like a threshold. So like if you're like within like 0 0.0001, you know, millimeters of another point, like it'll just weld those together and nothing else. But sometimes the weld operation goes in um, and it just like, welds everything to like an average in the middle and then we would have gotten like this whole seat like super compressed and not how we wanted it. So that's my mesh, you know, pieced together. It looks like it's still uh, showing one color being off. Whoops. Let's go back to it. Cool. There we go. It looks like it's still showing like the shading being off here in a second. If that really starts bothering me, um, I can go in and fix it, but I think it's fine for now. Cool. Let me see. Um, I don't think there's an issue with the normals anymore. Let's slap back over to faces. I can just see, like I can just grab one face and I can go model normals. Flip normals. Yeah, it's going to flip it for the entire object, which is fine. We'll just flip them back. Okay, cool. Should be good. If you render a cloud, does it become rain? If you want it to, I could do some. Uh, I could do some dynamic streaming at some point if anyone was ever interested in that. Like, just dynamics are a lot of fun to play around with. You can do things like make clouds and make rain, mesh points and things like that. Uh, real fast, I'm gonna go ahead and do a mesh smooth. See how this is looking. Oh, see now if I smooth it, now like all my models fine. I don't know. I don't know why it's a. Uh, displaying like a shading on the wireframe, but I think it's just uh, some render weirdness that we'll fix and not worry about. So that seat's not looking too bad. Let me jump back real fast. I do think I want to add some more edge loops on the side here, and the front at least, because I don't think I want it to round that much. A cloud making stream? Yeah, we could absolutely do it. There's lots of cool things you can do with dynamics, uh, like because I mean, when you're doing ex dynamics, you're like blowing stuff up. You know, you're making like because like an explosion is clouds. Like you're breaking stuff, like uh, like bases and stuff, and shattering them. Because you're doing things that you know with physics and math. You know that would be very hard to animate by hand. And you can make a lot of cool things. And they're pretty simple to set up. I mean, like a good one's hard to do because you have to get like all your parameters like spot on. But uh, just when you're messing with things and just making it, it's very easy to make something quickly. It's just hard to get it to do exactly what you want because everything's controlled by variables. Okay, so I want to make this, uh, I want to hold this edge a little bit, so I'm going to go ahead and put in another loop here. So I'm going to go back to my wireframe, I'm going to go to top down mode, and I'm going to go ahead and grab this. And I'm just going to slice it right up front here. Okay, so we're going to cut plane again. Just go across. My rotation's good, it's already zeroed out, so I'm just gonna collapse it. And I've got that line up in front that I can use, and I'm just gonna go ahead and see how that looks, because I do want a little softness to it. Uh, but... There we go, I want my options to be a little. Okay, cool, so let's take a look at this. Yeah, that looks more like what I'm looking for. So this is kind of how sub subdivision modeling works, where you're just kind of like, finding how soft or hard you want any specific area of your mesh to be. And then you're going in and holding the edges you want to be have harder edges and then keeping the edges you don't soft. And then like just letting the algorithm average out, you know, the hardness and softness. And you can always go back and tweak it. It's not like it's, um, it's set in stone or it's something you can't control. Uh, basically you can go in and do whatever you need to, to fix it. And even though this looks a little rough, it's kind of just a placeholder right now because I can keep smoothing it out, right? Like to really get like the desired look I'm looking for. It's just right now I don't need all the geometry. And since we're working with a browser-based operation, I can kind of keep it at this um, level of detail 
I guess would be a good way to say it, without having to go too high. I'm going to go ahead and get back the rest of my chair, because I do like seeing everything, like as I work. Um, I kind of just hit everything for an example. But it also makes the stream look cooler if someone like pops in. Because like if someone popped in now, they'd be like, what is this? What are we looking at? Uh, so we'll go back and get the rest of our chair so that people can see that we actually do have something that we're working on. So we're going to get everything back except these merged meshes, I think. We'll need to rename this too so we know what we're looking at. So let's bring that stuff back. Yep, there it all is. We also have this one low poly one that I think I can get rid of. Is it this one? Yes. So we'll just delete this one out. I'm okay not having that anymore. And the merged meshes will need to be renamed. We'll rename it as chair seat. Just something general so that we know what we're doing, what we're looking at. Okay, cool. So you can kind of see how these tools interact. And this kind of gets to, this is a good segue into another, uh, let me make this a little bigger. This is kind of a segue into another uh, kind of case when you're working with subdivision mesh meshes, and that's kind of how much should be in one mesh versus how much should be in multiple meshes. So like, what I mean by that is everything we've done right here, it could have just been one model, right? Like you could have just, um, maybe not these floating armrests, but definitely for like this back of the chair back here, like I could have extruded this pillow like out of the geometry, you know, and kept this all one object. And why did I not do that? Uh, for one, it's harder. The more complicated your geometry, um, the more like it's going to be harder to put those loops where you want them. Because like I would have had to put a loop like right here on the side, I'd have to get a loop like right here to hold the place, and you're going to start getting artifacts in your mesh and like edges where you don't want them. Um, you can like work around and finagle a mesh, but uh, but it's usually better to do multiple like multiple meshes and multiple objects to make a more complicated one. And what I'm saying for that is I'm gonna like kind of run a plane back here behind the chair and kind of make like an undercarriage right here. And I could do this by like extruding it out of the geometry I already have, but I'm gonna just make a new object for it. So to do that, we're gonna make um, a plane. If you watched my last uh, stream on this, you saw that we did a lot of stuff with just taking cubes and like pushing them into the shapes we wanted, but this time we're going to use a plane instead. So that's a rather big plane. Are the armrests going to stay floating in the final version? I mean, they could. Like, it could be like a sci-fi chair, but no, I was planning on connecting them. Um, I'm just getting kind of my basic shapes in mind before we, we start getting in too far. So we've got this plane in just the plane. Let's go back. There we go. Cool. And we're going to scale this in quite a bit, actually, because what most of what we're going to do here is with extrusions. Let's see. So my normal is on this side, so we're going to flip it around. What I'm going to do here, actually, let me do the rotation. We'll just take it to 90 right here for now. Because what we're going to do, or negative 90, excuse me, because what we're going to do here is we're going to just cut this up. I'm going to use that cut faces tool. So we'll take this plane, and we're going to cut plane it. But we're going to do this in a view that lets me see. It doesn't have to be this way, but like it's just easier to see what I'm doing. So we're going to take one. I say that and there's like the whole chair in the way, but rotation 90, I don't think that's right. Select that, cut plane. Yeah, that looks better. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to see. I was just in the wrong, that was in the transform. So I'm going to turn this local rotation to zero. There we go, and we'll collapse it. And we're just going to do this a few times. We're just going to make some cuts in here. It doesn't matter how many. If I need more, I can do that later. But I'm just going to add like several into this. Just make sure I keep zeroing them out so my edges are nice and even. Grab some faces and just keep going down. 
I'm just going to do like maybe five right now. I might need more or less, but this is what I'm going to stick with for now. I'm going to zero these out, as always. And then we'll collapse it. And we'll just keep working our way down. There's probably a faster way to do this, like where you can just set up the subdivisions like right off the start, but I think this is fine for right now. And I'll find the faster way at some point. Because I don't need to do too much out of here. Zero. And zero. And these also don't have to be centered. Like I could just not care and just kind of eyeball it, but I like things being lined up. Okay, cool. So I think that's all the subdivisions I want for right now. So what that gives me is it gives me some leeway to work with on the plane. So what I can do now is I can take this shape not the faces, the whole thing. I can kind of move it into place and I'm going to just kind of make like an undercarriage where the armrest just kind of fits in and it holds everything together right here. So we're anchoring the back of the chair to the base. And to do that I'm just going to navigate to a side view. Looks like this one is perspective but we want to make it right it looks like. yeah. So we'll do a right view right here. I'm going to go ahead and scale this up. I'm going to turn this to wireframe. And then we're going to go into vertex mode over here and we're just going to start pushing points around. Okay, so there's my top two. And then we're just moving this down. And all we're doing is just putting together the shape of how this is going to fit under and connect the chair together. So it's going to be something like this. I'll just grab that. Something that's just going to anchor it in. And I want it to end up under here. Again, you know how I say like start rough and refine? Like, I mean, same thing right here. Like, this can be super rough at this point. Like, you just kind of want to get the shapes where you think they need to go. So like right here, I'm just going to anchor it right about there. Anchor that, so maybe here to get the mesh on. I want it to kind of be a spring. Yeah, that mimics the shape of the cushion. Well, like it would, right? Because like, it would like fit under and like be tucked in. We're just kind of working the armrest back up here. And then we go probably like midway up the back. Um, if you're working on like a modeling project, like I encourage you to use reference, like find a picture of a chair and like, you know, like try to make something that's grounded in reality. If you know, if that's what you're going for, like it could also be that you're just trying to make like something really cool and you're like, no, nah, I just make what I want. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Like I'm kind of going off the image of what I think, what parts I think a chair has, <laughs> you know, like in real life, like, like I'm pretty sure that like chairs have these right like this is a thing a chair has which isn't always great because sometimes like if even if you're doing something like stylized or like fantasy like most stuff is like based in uh, in reality in like some regard so it's good to have an idea of like what those parts are but I'm not doing it right now I'm just kind of working without reference from from my imagination so uh, <laughs> you can also feel free to do it that way but if you ever feel stuck uh, grab a hold of some pictures of chairs or whatever it is you're working on and just look at them so you can find out what the parts are. Cool. So we're going to just kind of make like an undercarriage right through here and this is just holding the parts together. Afterwards we'll probably do something like this with the um, armrests too. Whoops. With the armrests too we're, we're going to actually connect them underneath. We'll mount some loops around them and then push them underneath like they've got a metal housing that's holding them in place. We'll probably before then also um, make sure that these armrests are the size I want them. They look a little big. I might scale them down. Okay. Uh, one of the nice thing about subdivision modelers, you don't get it so much here. I feel like this is one thing I find lacking with Clara. Oh wait, no, you can do it here. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So what you can do with subdivision modelers, like is that if the detail ever gets too high, you can come up to the uh, mesh smooth option right here and you can always just go back to your, your base version. I don't think I've been doing this because uh, I'm getting I'm getting used to Clara, right? But like you want to be able to 
step uh, up and down through your subdivision levels because like if you see a change you need to make you know just like go down to level zero you know and make it on the basic version because it'll be so much easier you know to work with than you know all these polygons like up here on subdivision level two so just keep that in mind when you're working uh, that you should be stepping up and down you know subdivision levels if you need to okay all right so that undercarriage looks good so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to select the whole thing under face mode real fast i'm going to find my like shortcuts here because they just fly faster so that's like y u i y u i o them oh y u i m weird well i'm not going to use m anyway y u i y u i okay so like face mode is u cool hotkeys are just save you so much time the like quiver minted hotkeys thank you uh we're not so it's y yeah y okay so we got this, and we're going to do an extrusion. So it's not an inset. Yeah, we're actually going to extrude. Cool. Hmm. I'm wondering if I extrude this to two, what does offset do? Nothing. That's fine. You can do multiple segments if I want. I'm just seeing if there's like a better extrusion option. Individual polygons probably is not what I'm looking for. We'll stick with average normals. We can always clean this up. Okay, so then I can actually put some thickness into my shape and maneuver it how I want it to be. So right now I've got this kind of bar underneath it and I'm just gonna go in and clean it up a little bit after I do the extrusion. So we'll go to I and we'll just pull some vertices around. That's kind of the name of the game here. I said it in my last stream, but um, most like subdivision modeling like is literally just like, you know, until you get like a an algorithm to do it, you know, for you, and it's like parametric parametrically based. Like most of it's just pushing vertices around. Like that's really like all it is, you know. Any because like even like with digital sculpting, which is something I do a lot of, like in the end of the day, you're just pushing vertices around, you know. And you're just trying to get the shape that you're after. What time is it, 12.40? Okay. Yeah, shout out to sh keyboard shortcuts, exactly. They're just, they just save you so much time. Oh my gosh. It's kind of crazy. Hmm. And I don't have arrow key movement, okay. That's something else that uh, I really like that's not in here, at least that I've found, is just the ability to move points, like, in these, um, not in these orthographic views, like with your keyboard, with your mouse, like with your keyboard keys, because, like, that'd be super useful right now, because I can make all these fine tunes, like, a lot faster, because I could just, like, push them around. But right now I'm just, like, looking for a good shape. Like, somewhere where it's mounted. Might be the kind of thing where in a second, like, I'm going to, uh, like, put a plate in here in the back. Let me see, how would that look? Let's turn this off real fast and see what we're looking at. So if I were to put a plate back here, I think this looks fine, actually. Like, I think you can, like, do the impression that it's, like, cradling the chair already. I think at some point I might add a little more detail, like, do an extrusion, but I think this looks good. Like, this makes sense to me as a, uh as a piece of like as like a machine hmm it does look though can i do the opposite let me see if i can do this yeah it doesn't look like it um it does look like my normals need to be flipped though i'm wondering Ooh, yeah here's what i'm looking for so this is super useful if you're ever working on like something with lots of objects like this and you need to get around these visible options where you've got the hide unselected or hide selected like this is super nice. So I can grab this and I can say hide unselected. Boom, right there. And then I can go in and I can grab my faces that are being a problem. Like that. Oh, are there not? Did it not extrude out the, the solid body? Hold on. It might be just working. Yep, it didn't. Okay, we can fix this. So ideally, I'd want it to bridge these gaps right here, but 
I can do the same thing with just a bridge operation. So one second. And we will take these off and hopefully this doesn't confuse it too much. Mm, looks okay to me. There we go, snap it in. Okay, so now that we've got you know the full mesh, we can like just look at the whole thing and see that everything's good. And then as soon as we're done, you know, working on this thing that was hidden, we can go back to uh, the selection and we can just say show all. Boom, we're back in business. So if you're ever you know finding like it hard to see what you're working on, just just remember that you usually have these visibility options and you can like work without. Because I could just go into like the Explorer and like grab everything by hand, but um, I think we're fine with what we're working on right now. So I'm going to say, I don't even know what you would call this. Maybe like a connector. It's like a, I think that's descriptive enough to know what it is at least. Okay, so we have this on here. And this is fine right now. I'm gonna look at a subdivision of it and kind of see. This is something I feel like that doesn't need a lot of fleshing out. Really, I wanna just keep going into the blocking stage. Because really, as soon as everything's blocked out, like that's when you can add your detail. And right now, I still wanna block out like the chair. Um, this is gonna be like a swivel chair, and I still wanna block out like the, uh, like the wheel tracks, like down below. So I don't think this needs to be refined very much. I could do a mesh, mesh smooth just to see how it's looking. Um, it's not too bad. I don't know if I'd want it rounded at the top. I kind of like the pinched edges though, like how it's like coming together. I think it definitely does need some work, but oh, well, it's not terrible. But I do like the basic um, shape it's having. I might have it follow this chair a little bit more. And you can always do that at this stage too. Like so, um, so I've got my subdivision right here. Let's see if I can find it. I guess I should select the mesh first. So I've got my subdivisions right here. You can work on whatever subdivision you want. So like, let's say I don't have the geometry like to get the shape I need. You can always just subdivide it, you know, cause then it'll like quadruple your geometry, uh, double it along the edge right here. And then you can just go in and move the vertices. And like, if you go back, it'll still be fine. Like it'll reflect the change. So you can also use subdivide as a modeling tool as well. But I think this is fine for now. I want to keep blocking in and I'll come back to it in a sec. Um, I'm wondering which arm I still want to go with. Probably this one. I was thinking about, yeah, it holds the chair together. That's the important thing, exactly. Like it's not, it's not a cool piece to look at. Like if you're looking at the chair, you know, like as a model, like your your eye is not gonna get drawn to this piece. I mean, maybe it is. Like if you like are a specialist who you know installs these for a living, and you're gonna be like, oh, I don't know. They could have spent some more time modeling that. But no, like it's just there to be functional and like you know um, let you know that the chair will stay together, like and look realistic. Because otherwise, it looks like it's floating, and you don't want that. You know, I know we 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 have these floating armrests that have been here the whole time, but um, but this is fine for right now. And it just kind of brings the whole the whole model together at this point. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come down here and I think work on this undercarriage. Again, the um, things that attach the armrest to the underseat, I'm not too concerned about. I'm just going to let them float for now and I'm going to block out this base. So I think for this base block out, I'm going to grab one of these cylinders that we made last time. And the fun thing about these cylinders is they're quad cylinders. So they're all quads, which is very handy if you're working with um, models like this in the subdivision stuff, because uh, triangles don't subdivide well. I can like grab some to show you, uh, but like if I ran like a edge loop through something and then tried to subdivide the triangles, they they turn out really weird. They triangulate well, but they don't they don't subdivide well. So I think in order to get this with the bottom cap, I could go in and just recreate the top, but that's going to take a long time. So what we're going to do is we're going to clone it, slide it down, go to my transform node, and we're going to scale it on the Y to negative one. And basically all you're doing here is inverting it. 
After you do that, just make sure your normals are correct. Like I said, or you'll wind up like uh, the other one I made, but I'm just gonna go in and make sure. So normal, model, normals, and then we could do auto smooth or we could flip them. If we flip them, I think that looks right. And then you kind of got this model node. Yeah, that looks good to me. I might grab these faces here just to take a look. Oops. So do I have a normal editing mode on the face node? I'm just trying to see. I'm just like looking for things that um, exist in other modeling packages and seeing if they exist inside of Clara. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like if you went to edit, I don't think so. I think I think you have to do the normals as a model operation. It looks like, <clears throat> and I might be totally wrong. I'm just seeing properties. Yeah, no, I think we're good. Okay, but this looks good. And then what we can do is just combine them together. Do we have a snap? If you don't, that's fine. We're fans of cubes here. Yeah, we are. We're all about we're all about squares. And how they combine to make make 3D stuff, because that's all we're doing. We're just using uh, vertices in space. Hmm. I almost want to see. Might be under like the layouts. No, I don't think so. Just looking through my options. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add these up and then I'm going to snap them together. So real fast, we're just going to move this up. Oh, this got reverted back. Let's go back here to right view, I think. Yeah, that'll work. So I'm just going to move this up. If you ever have two objects like this and you need to merge them together, like in a way that the vertices combine, what you can do is you can come up, grab your objects, You can go to model, merge. So now they are one object. And then you can grab both sets of vertices in your vert in vertex mode. And you can use your scale tool. And they'll basically scale infinitely into each other. Like they won't go past each other. They'll just keep moving into each other until they're like exactly on top of each other. And then what you can do is just grab them all and then do a weld operation. And then if we go through and check, let me see, make sure that worked. I think I might be picking up uh, <laughs> some, yeah, picking up some extra vertices. Oh no. Well, that was a mistake. Hold on. So when I did my combine option, because I was working in the right, let me move this back. Yeah. I accidentally picked up this uh, this other cylinder back here, but it's fine. We can undo. So we'll merge these two together. Object merge. All right, now we should be good. And maybe we'll do this on a uh, front view instead. There we go. OK. We're back on track. And we'll scale these vertices into each other, keep going. Yeah, you see like in there, we just keep getting lower and lower. We could even go further, we could go like point zero 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 one, because why not? And then um, then we can merge them together. So we'll weld, 44 of 114 selected, you see up here, zero of 86, because it merged them together. And we're all good. So now we can use this as a base um, for our chair. And I'm just going to copy this. Clone as a copy, not a reference. Interesting. Hmm, did I pick anything else up in my copy? I'm just wondering. I don't think so. I think it's just that. 
so if you ever get your origin wandering off somewhere funny, I think we can just go. I know there's origin snapping stuff. Hold on. Transform, pivot, center pivot. There we go. All good. And then we can bring this back and actually position it the way we want it. So anyway, back at the chair. I think what we're gonna do here is actually make a change. No, this should be good actually. So what we can do to anchor this in together is I can grab this, go to my faces. The reason I'm taking a little bit longer to make these decisions is I'm thinking about like creative things, which is uh, a lot more time consuming than technical things. I think I'm gonna do an extrusion. Are you gonna let me do it? Or did you already extrude it? Hmm. Maybe I need to do one at a time. But let me just make sure that I haven't. No, I've done extrusions. Let me back that up then. So I'm gonna extrude these out. Two faces selected, extrude. We do the same thing on this side. Two faces selected, extrude. And then if we go under poly mesh, we can look at our extrusion history and our transform vertices. Let's go 1 point negative 1, 5. And the only reason we're doing this is because we can 1.15 is we can uh, make this consistent on both sides. And then we have something that's like truly centered and the way it should be. So we kind of have this undercarriage now that's fitting under here. So yeah, so what I'm doing right there is just um, that you can go back through your history of like everything you've done to edit the object and you can still make changes after the fact. Sometimes they kind of bump into each other like if I did an extrusion here and then like modeled something off the extrusion, like I might mess up that by messing with the extrusion, but since I just did this, it's fine. And then I can just like look at the length of the extrusion or the, the transform vertices, 1.15, negative 1.15, because I'm going the other way and I can make sure that they're offset to the same amount. So just something to keep in mind if you're, you're doing your modeling. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back in and grab my shape right here now that I've given myself a little bit more area to work with underneath and I'm going to go ahead and put this yeah history is so helpful it, it is like um, I'm actually used to not having one because um, when I started using Mod Maya it didn't have a very robust like version history where you could just like go back and modify you know any changes you made that has changed since then but um, yeah it's so convenient to have that all right so we're going to go into this and for this I'm going to kind of eyeball it but line it up so I've got my wireframe right here, which is perfect. And that looks good to me. It's far too big. I mean, obviously, like you wouldn't sit on this, but we're gonna go ahead and make it about the appropriate size. Okay, and what I like to do with any attachment points, like if I'm like really attaching a mesh like this, is that this doesn't look that realistic, right? Because um, even if you were like looking at this and it was just like, just like welded to this, you know, like just someone just welded it on, like you'd still see like a little ring. Uh, you'd see, still see like a little ring around it where like the weld went in. So anytime that I do an attachment, like between two mechanical parts, like what I almost always do is I uh, model like a, some kind of attachment point. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is just another little ring like out here, just like slightly bigger. Something like this. 
Because what this does is that if you look at it like from an outside or from a distance, and it might not even matter too much like on here. I'm gonna scale this up a little bit more. But like if you're ever like looking at the mechanical like attachment points, like having these like connectors uh, before like just like having these connectors as part of them just does like a lot of heavy lifting for like the believability of like any shapes in the scene. Because like now I can believe that like maybe there was like something modeled on or like a, you know like so, like welded on to this point that it would fit into you know for the pneumatic you know operation of like the chairlift. And then when I get further down, I can do the same thing. So like I can clone this again, move it down, and I can like scale it up like this. That might be a little too much. Let's move it. Just kind of like barely inside, and then I can like extend it like something like this. Let me uh, pull this one down actually. I think is the way I want to go with this, something like that. Now like you have like you know the interlocking like pneumatic part of the chair, like kind of working together in like a way that's like semi-realistic. It doesn't have to be right, right? Like. Um, because this is more of like a visualization of a chair like we don't have to make it exactly the way it is it's like you just want to create the belief that this mechanism you know operates the way you think it does now if we were engineering or actually designing a chair then in that case of course we'd have to like have everything right but this is art you know like this is this is more art and artists like are great at doing as little as they have to you know you don't have to build the whole inner workings of the chair. You just have to build something that people see as a chair. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to just kind of take a second and look at this. I got that weird shading thing going on. I wonder if I can like fix this with a material. Hold on one second. I'm going to take a little side detour, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't, but you know. I don't think I need to assign a PR. I'm just taking a side detour to look through the material library real fast. Um, it's not something I planned on getting like into uh, when I started, but I just want to look and see. So these are just materials, material library. I just want like a standard shader. I think it's fine. We'll just leave it alone for now. I just like having like a very uniform gray surface, and the, the merge is uh, throwing me off a little bit, but I'm not too worried about it. So like if I if I smooth the mesh, it gets rid of it. If I apply a mesh smooth, but then when it comes back, it's still there. So it's whatever. Yeah, and right now there's just no material assigned, right? So like it doesn't even matter. You're all for detours, yeah. Well, we can you know we could start like blocking out a, a material system on here. Like it'd be easy because we don't need any. Uh, stuff so you could assign something like I'm just looking through the material library that we have on hand so real fast what do we got plastics metallics I'd say this is more of a plastic something like that mm-hmm and then once I have a material applied, do I have material? Yeah, I can mess with my colors too. Okay, good, because solid black is uh, not the way I want to go. So I can select my color, and cool, I don't have to put in a hex, a hexadecimal. I can just pop it up. What color did I go with here? 5, 5D, 5D, 5D. Same thing. We'll just put it in. Easy enough to remember. All lowercase. Okay. And then I'm wondering. So this is just like. So I wonder if the emissive is overriding it. This is just a basic like uh, material library. Um, I wonder if I could like input maps. Yeah, you could bring your zone in. Yeah, it's got a full fully fledged texturing. Uh, PBR texturing pipeline in here too, which is good to know. 
I'm not going to do any texturing today, but um, it's cool to mess with. I wonder if it's reflected in the shader. Probably not if it's live. Like I was, I was wondering if um, the view frame would reflect all the changes I made, and I'm thinking if it's a browser based, it probably wouldn't. But you never know, so I'm just wondering. So like I can mess with like the metallic, you know, nature. I could like put it at one, you know, and go through. And yeah, you don't see a change reflected because it's not reflected in the view screen. Well, there you go. <laughs> now it's transparent. Yeah, it's the opacity. Oh, that's cool. So you can scale the opacity. So like down to you know zero. Now you can no longer see it. 0.5. Yeah. Cool, cool. So it's just interesting. So like if I put so the metallic's at one, but it's not gonna make a difference. Yeah. Okay. Roughness is pretty high too. Automatic render, force opaque. Okay, and then yeah, and then I can put in bump and normal maps for it too. Cool, good to know. They've got a lot of stuff in here, it looks like. I wonder if you've got like a full material node or you're just uh, working inside. Okay, so physical. I wish it would update a little bit on here, but I'm wondering. So if I went to my renderer. I'm just watching for a live render real fast. How would you make your own textures? That's a good question. Um, so. This is getting into like a whole uh, other pipeline. And let me see, I'm gonna look them up over here. One sec, uh, you can't see what's happening right now, but I'm pulling up, pulling up a PBR texturing chart. PBR texture chart, yeah, there's lots of good ones in here. So I'm about to bring in another screen. So what PBR stands for uh, outside of Pabst? blue ribbon if you know like it's probably the most well-known acronym but um it's physics based rendering and so what i'm going to bring in here onto my screen is going to be uh basically if you can see that let me pop my twitch over here so i can watch so basically what you can see that is um is it's basically a chart that's detailing um, how you can make textures. And basically all that you're doing is making a 2D texture map, like something like, you know, just a bitmap image, like something you'd make in Photoshop, like that's all you're doing. And then you're assigning um, grayscale values to it, if that makes sense. So like zero to one, uh, zero being totally black and one being completely white. And what they do is they control the appearance of how the um, camera renders the texture. So using physics-based rendering, you usually have um, three main like components to it. You have albedo, at least in, uh, albedo is the base color. So while most of them are measured in uh, grayscale, albedo is measured in RGB or whatever color rendering you're usually using, usually RGB if you're working um, with 3D, so you'll like actually set a base color. And it doesn't have to be just one base color, like, I mean, it'll look like whatever you're doing, just uh, put out on a 2D image. So if you had these bricks, it would look like brick. And that kind of works, but the thing is, is that you don't get any light reflecting off the brick because it's just color, right? It looks very flat and it looks kind of like, um, like it doesn't look realistic because in real life, like color is bouncing off the brick, color is being, uh, light is being absorbed into the brick, uh, light is bouncing off the brick. If it's wet, you know, the brick becomes shiny or glossy. Um, so it's the different ways. So in order to create these reflective properties, you have two other properties, which are microsurface um, or gloss is what it's called in lots of rendering applications. So the glossier a surface is, the more uh, light it's going to reflect. And you can have a very reflective surface um, without being metallic. So like this gl glossy plastic right here would have a very high um, microsurface or gloss value because it's reflecting a lot of white light off of it. But it's not metallic, so you wouldn't get like an image reflected. And then to do metals, you usually have a reflectivity value or a metallic value. Um, so if you turn that up really high, you'll actually see the world reflected because you can um, have a shiny surface without being reflective, right? Like you can sh like have a lot of light bounce off without having any reflectivity. So by combining these three things into three separate um, 
two-dimensional maps is what they're called, but they're really just pictures. They're pictures that you create, like you, you draw them yourself, like in a, in a map or you um, bake them out of like another application. You can create like any texture you want. And if you're ever doing like real-time applications like VR or video games, uh, the geometry for those things, like, you know, like I'm modeling geometry right here in this stream, the geometry is really simple. It's actually, um, it's actually the textures that do most of the heavy lifting. Let me see if I can find, hold on, I'm going to throw this off here. I'm going on another tangent, but um, let me see if I can find like a full like breakdown of someone with all their maps applied. Um, one second. I know this is riveting content. I'm doing it off screen, you know, in case I pull up something that shouldn't be, I shouldn't be showing. Not that I think I would, but you know, it's just best to be safe. Okay. Yeah, here's a good one. So here is a diver's helmet that they have modeled. And they have, like I was talking about, they have the albedo, the metalness, and the roughness. Uh, the roughness and the gloss are kind of synonymous. It's basically the same map. So um, every, uh, every one is kind of set on a scale of zero to one. So you have the albedo map, and it's, um, it's kind of weird because this is mostly metallic, and metallic albedos behave a little differently than like every other surface. But if you look at like the rope, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Like there's the color for the rope, but it looks kind of flat and dead because it's not bouncing light uh, the way it should. So then you can control that uh, reflection of surface, like the reflectivity and the glossiness through these maps. So you look at the metallic map, it's very white. And the reason for that is because this helmet is metallic. Um, it's going to be it's going to have reflectivity. So every part that isn't metallic, like the hose, is colored black because it's not a metal. And then basically they've just drawn this on. Then the roughness is how reflective or shiny something is. So this hose, like this plastic hose, is actually very shiny, so it's whiter. Um, but it's black, so you and it has no reflectivity. So you can see you've got a little bit of light coming off of it. Um, but it's not... You can't see like yourself in it. Whereas this uh, metal is very grungy, you know, it's very grimy, so it's actually not reflecting that much light, it's just reflective, um, so it's not that shiny or glossy. So like, by using these maps in conjunction with each other, you can create the textures for anything. So it's just kind of a combination of them working together uh, to create textures for it. So this is just kind of what it looks like in, in person. And there's more maps than this. Like there's, there's tons of maps. Um, there's things like normal mapping where you're uh, actually creating surface detail on a 2D map. And they're basically all just clever ways to um, <laughs> save on render, render time because it's actually very expensive for the processor to render um, lots of polygons. Like it's very performance intensive. So, but it actually is very good at drawing 2D textures, so um, you can just save on a lot of processing power doing it this way. And that's why games, uh, video games that need to run in real time, use these maps. So, didn't mean to go off on a tangent here, uh, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about texturing since I'm doing it. Okay, looks like my rendering isn't coming through that well, so I'm just going to leave it for now. And we'll just go back kind of into working in the game, or in this mode. Okay, so once I have like you know my basic um, shape here in the bottom, I'm gonna go ahead and start extruding out some forms. I'm probably actually going to take a little bit of a break here um, in one second just because I need to grab something, but then I will be right back. So give me one second and I'm going to go ahead and pause the stream for a sec, and then I'll be back probably within the next five minutes. So if you give me one second, I'll put this up here. Uh, probably not going to do textures on the chair today. Modeling is like kind of in itself, like a full-time thing. Uh, I just want to, I want to put that out there. I saw that you said that before I take a break. So probably no, probably not going to do full textures on it. Um, I might put in some placeholder textures to differentiate it. Um, but um, I'm going to probably put in some placeholder textures just to kind of like show me what I'm looking at and then maybe like to block out like the different parts. Uh, but I am going to focus on the modeling this stream. I'd love to do a texturing stream sometime because it's a lot of fun. Um, but I'd probably need some more time to play around with the texturing tools. 
Um, also, I'm kind of bad at texturing. Like, I think I can get by, but it's like, it's definitely not my main wheelhouse, um, just because it's not always necessary for things, but I definitely can texture. So I just need some more preparation because I can't like do it uh, as much by the seat of my pants. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a pause here for a second, and I will be right back in a few minutes. Sorry for the break.
Hey everyone, uh, thanks for bearing with me right there. I'm back and I think I'm ready to go. What I literally just did was move my entire stream setup from one room to the another in the house. Because I have, uh, my wife is doing um, interviews today and we've kind of been trading off the office. Um, and she was putting our daughter down so I didn't want to be out streaming in the living room while she was crying like if she was having a rough put down. So thanks for bearing with me, but I was just trying to get everything back on track. And it looks like we are back up and running. Okay. So that went a little faster than I thought it would. <laughs> I had to move two monitors, a microphone, and my laptop uh, out here. So I'm glad I could do that fairly quickly. All right, cool. So we're going to get back into the modeling of this. So the next step I want to do for this chair is to get the um, like trestles modeled out. And I think what I'm going to do. This one might be a little harder with, um, let me just make sure my audio, yeah, my audio is coming through. This one, I'm just going to make sure that um, my extrusions work. So first, I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to start grabbing some of these. So maybe do two, skip two. Just see how this looks real fast. So I think four will work. And I think this is divided into 16. So I think this is perfect. Yeah, so this works. So one, two, three, four, and then we're skipping two. Um, so this is just kind of good planning. Like if this was off or it was an odd number, uh, this wouldn't work because basically I would have an unmatched like spacing between them. And a lot of times if you're doing this kind of surface modeling, a lot of things kind of work like that where if um, something is off like topographically, topographic meaning like the spacing of the polygons and vertices and how they like outline, you know, to make a full shape. If something is off topographically, uh, a lot of times you can wind up with something you don't want. So sometimes it's good to like kind of plan ahead and get things in place. So I think I can do an extrusion on all these. I just want to see my length real fast. So I put my length out, let's say six. Hmm. I wonder if it's because of my groups. <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's looking a little, uh, that's a little dramatic right there. But it does mean that they're all the same length. I think I can work with this, actually. I'm just wondering right here, average normal and then Individual polygons isn't good in this case, so we'll stick with local normals. So yeah, it's like a chair helicopter, like a propeller coming off. So what I'm going to do here, I wonder, do I have a local? You know, we got world. What if I do local here? So we'll go local scaling, scale on the X. Nah, it's still going to apply them as a group because it's applying that same bounding box. I just want to make sure. Okay, so we'll scale these all down individually. So I'm just going to grab these. And if this seems like it's taking too long, uh, I can adjust. Hmm. Yeah, I just want to narrow these vertices down. I don't think it should be super hard. And I don't get it off of local either. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Yeah, just have to find the right scale. So we can scale down on the Z. Oh, it's actually inverted them though. I didn't realize that. Do I have anything else selected? It's just these two, right? Sorry, I'm just figuring out the, the mysteries of the local scaling. No, it's going to scale the um, inside too, which is not what I want. OK, I'm going to back this up a little bit. Because I think what will be easiest, if I think about it right now, is just using this script. I'm also going to bring this down a little bit and try to maximize my real estate. Okay, there we go. Looks very sturdy. Yeah, absolutely. Because really all I want to do is translate these out like this, right? And I think what I'm going to do is do it this way. So we're going to transform each one as individually, and they're going to scale uniformly in the X and Z, it looks like, on the local scale. So I'm just going to put these out. I need to think about how far. Maybe three? I think three sounds good. I'm just looking right here. 
it's just good now because if I like get a good idea of my perspective, like at this point, I can save some time later. So I'm just thinking about it. Three might be a little much. Maybe like 2.7, 2.6. So we can do that in here. 2.6. 2.7. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is basically perform this for all three. Um, if it gave me a little better uniform options, like I wouldn't have to do these all individually, like I could do them all at one time. But I think this is fine. 2.6. Uh, remember that you're working on all sides of a positive, negative, x, y, z plane though. So remember to go negative when you need to and positive when you need to. This one should be negative, negative. Oops. And make sure you grab the right ones that you extruded earlier. There we go. So yeah, negative 2.6, negative 2.6 is what I need. So thank you for bearing with me while I do this <laughs> riveting typing. And then we'll do one more back here, and then that should be good for the spacing. Do something like that. Okay. There we go. And then 2.6, negative 2.6. You can also just eyeball all of this, but I mean, this is this is probably better, like at the end, of, in, on the like in the end scale. Okay, now that we've got all these mapped out, we're going to um, take our vertices and we're going to scale them in. I think because this is looking a little bit go. Okay. Wonder if I can just like copy and paste everything. You can also eyeball this one. The urge to eyeball is always like so strong. You're like, ooh, should I eyeball it? You know, it'll save me so much time if I just eyeball it, but in the end, it's probably not worth it. Let's go to world for this one, actually, because we just need to scale two settings in. Yeah. Okay, so we're doing a vertice transform, and this is a new one. So we're gonna scale these in. But if I don't use my world, well, I can do them uniformly. And then like Z, X. So I can do like a negative two up top. Sorry, I'm just thinking about my transforms. Negative 0.2. And then like a negative three for Y and Z. Wait. No. Negative two for both of these and then like a negative 3.5 yeah that looks good so negative two negative 0.05 i wonder can i grab all three of these sometimes it lets you copy and paste everything it doesn't look like it's going to though and the only reason i'm doing this like long workaround and no it's not very interesting but it's just so that i can make sure that i get everything like exactly where it needs to go so i can grab this and it can give me the transform so Negative 0.2, negative 0.035, negative 2. Okay. So this one's. And I always do them here first because, again, there are negative and positive you need to keep up with. So this is 0 0.2, negative 0.2, negative 0.035. And then this just is basically going to give me um, conformity, like along all my chair sides. So I can use it like helpfully for that way. So this one is going in. Okay. Point three seven. Point 0.2 and point 0.2. It is nice that it logs these uh, vertices movements though. Like that's actually very helpful for everything that I need to do. 
It's annoying that I have to do them all like by hand versus just like scaling them all in, but uh, it is helpful to like have them all logged. Oops, make sure you're going the right way. So we'll scale that down, scale in, scale in. Okay, yeah, we're good. So negative, negative 0.2. 0.2 and then negative 3.7 or 0.37. All right, cool. And then we have all our chair legs uniform that we're using in here. Uh, and then this might need to go a little bit further down. Thanks for bearing with me while I do the very exciting work of typing in values three times. Uh, but we can always extend like this middle piece more and kind of, or just like push up these vertices right here and kind of get exactly what we need. So if we need to modify this, we always can. Like what we've made right now has no bearing on like what we need to make later. So like I can always like scale this up, grab the full shape and then just move it down. And that's what I'm kind of getting to do right now just to make sure everything's in proportion. Yeah, and now we kind of have something that has all the basic parts of a chair, like at this point now I'm like thinking about detailing, but like it's important to take a second and like look at perspective, you know, in proportion. Like, does this look like I want it to? This base might be a little bulky, I feel like, this center column. So I might scale this down. <laughs> We're modeling with math. I mean, yeah, I mean like you say, but even a surface modeler, which I would say is the more um, artistic kind of modeler base, uh, versus solid modeling where everything is algorithm based. It's still all math, right? Like at the end of the day, you're like moving around vertices and like their positions in space. Like it's an entirely a math based process. Uh, so thank you math for making this possible. Like thank you for making uh, Pixar possible and every use of 3D rendered graphics. And for making like pretty much every aspect of our life possible, you know, like modern modern life. This is kind of amazing. Yeah, and it looks just like a rolling chair now, except for the wheels, exactly. And we're, so all I'm looking at now is kind of like proportion, you know, kind of looking around and thinking about it. <laughs> Uh-oh, someone might need to be blocked. Yep, I right, got him. <laughs> Thank you, moderator. Okay, here we go. So right now, yeah, I mean, this is, interesting all I'm doing is just scaling and looking at proportion like because I'm just thinking about like how I want these shapes to look so I'm gonna make this I think a little smaller couldn't do it without math absolutely scale these down I think what we might do too let's get a face selection going on here we'll get these Oh yeah, sorry, we'll get these. Remember the other day when I needed to deselect everything? Yeah, it's important. It would take forever to deselect stuff like that. Okay, we'll extrude this top face. We're gonna scale it in something like this. It's interesting that I'm getting hard faces on here. I can always soften my normals, but it's just interesting. So what I was talking about when I was like saying getting hard faces is that when you use a 3D modeling application, it can render your normals soft or hard. Um, and I'll see if I can show you what I mean by that. I kind of need a top down view though. Instead of perspective, let's go top and let's do wireframe, just wireframe, whoops. Sorry, I'm just deselecting these uh, inner inner polygons. Mm -hmm. And then it's like looking looking down like a like an '80s video game. Okay, there we go. So I just want to see if I can soften my normals. Model, normals, yeah, and then you have auto smooth. Yeah, and then, yeah, and just smoothed up my normals right here. 
So all that's doing is basically just choosing how um, the engine renders the edges that you have, the faces you have. So some of one, it might harden some edges and others it might soften them. Sometimes you can control them like all together. I'm just looking at this right here. Can I like soften, soften edges in here? Grow, convert to edges, shrink none, invert, back facing. Hmm, doesn't look like it. I'm just trying to see and make sure, but yeah, it looks like some uh, some applications let you go in and like choose what edges to soften and which ones to harden. But I think that looks good. Okay. And I do like the effect of beveling this in, like scaling that in. I might even want one more cylinder in here though. I think I'm gonna clone another one. Let's go back to my selection tool. We'll grab this one and then we'll clone one. Yep, we'll call it clone a copy. Then we'll scale this down. Scale it, whoops, not on the Z, in every direction. Yeah, like this. We're just gonna put it down here. I'm just trying to scale this down real fast. So I want to just kind of set it on this inset bevel. Yeah, kind of like that. Maybe a little higher. Again, like if you're doing like this mechanical, you know, kind of modeling of like these like, you know, man-made parts, you always have to have some kind of connectors or it doesn't look right. Something like that. Yeah, that looks good. Cool. All right, so we're kind of getting our chair in place. Um, something else I would do, and I might, yeah, and I can probably just do this over here, is I want to scale these legs down. Because right now it looks like a very, it looks like a very nice, like, solid chair, but it's not really a rolling chair, because usually they're more tapered. So let's go grab our vertices. And we're gonna, just going to bring these all down. Make sure, yep, okay. And the reason we can do this all together, where the other one we had to do them all in one, is that we can manipulate this whole thing in world space and just bring it down. Like there's nothing complicated about this uh, this this operation. Whereas if we try to do a total scale, like you see, we're going to end up scaling out like the vertices as we go, which is not desirable. But we can move them all down. We want to do something really subtle, like something like that. Okay. And we'll go back to this mode. And pretty much now we're probably just going to put the wheels on and then we're done with um, the base model of our chair. Again, we also need to attach these handles at some point, these armrests. But I just kind of want to show what's possible and what we're doing. It's a pretty thick base, but I think it's okay. We'll leave it alone for now. Mm -hmm. And so if we're making a wheel, we're going to go back to our friend, the sphere. And we're going to have, go ahead and reset that pivot. Center the pivot. Yep. I'm just going to clone one. And we're going to scale these into position. I'm going to go back to a bigger screen. I feel like I'm doing like too much of this is on a small screen and it's harder to watch. But we're going to move this around. I'm going to just, whoops, I'm going to flip this, I'm going to try to, yeah, I don't know why it's being so hard to select this, but I'm just going to put it in 90 degrees, <laughs> easy, and I'm going to bring it over to the chair to kind of get the right size going on. Okay, cool. So we're in the chair leg right now. A little big for a wheel, I'd have to say. So we're going to scale it down a bit. Man, I'm only scaling in two directions right now. I'm trying to get that center. There. Uh, uh. Nah, I don't know. Why. It's like it's like locking out one of them. I wonder if it's like one of my transform options that it's like running into. Scale all three. No, well, it's probably something I'm doing. But I'm just going to get it down. Uh, 
how I need to. Because like a uniform scale should not be an issue. Oh, I wonder, it's probably, I know what it is. No, I'm still doing it, okay. Well, we could do a workaround with math. Actually, I wonder if it's because, one second, can I freeze these properties? I'm just I'm just seeing something real fast. I'm seeing if I have a, a feature. And lots of ones you can um, freeze your transformations. So like I could reset this scale, x y z all back to zero. I'm just wondering if I have that option here. Are some of them locked? That's cool. Monster truck wheels. Yeah. What kind of details would I add if I had a ton more time? Yeah, sorry, I've just been, <laughs> I've been so uh, perplexed by this wheel and why it's doing this. Uh, so I'd add a couple of things. So this is a good like first pass, I'd say, like uh, in the modeler, but like if I had a lot more time or I wasn't teaching, um, things I would do is I would add the wheels, I'd add caps for the wheels and attachment points. And what else I would do is I would think about um, where to add detail. So what I talk about when I do that is adding solid mesh details. So what I would do is I'd come here. Let me see if I can find my mesh smooth options. It's probably just under here under poly mesh. Yeah, under my subdivision options. What I would do is I would kind of look for things. And I said this a little bit in the last um, the last uh, stream, but I'd look for places where I could like really create some good details. So I'll give you an idea about what that means. So I've got like this seat back here and it looks fine. You know, it's kind of like a smooth mesh, but it's it's still kind of like, where's like the hems, you know, and stuff like that, where like the seams where stuff goes in. And you can create those pretty easily with subdiv subdivision modifiers. So I could go in, uh, grab this side right here, and then deselect everything else. And I could do like an extrusion from it. So I'm going to go ahead and extrude it. Move it pretty thin, actually. Let's say something like that. And then I'm going to do another extrusion. Well, that might be good enough. Like you just kind of have to test and see. So I'm going to keep that right there. And then I'm hoping I can just select this whole loop. Are you gonna let me? I wonder. If it's just gonna let me, yeah, because it, like it should let me grab it because it's all a full loop. But again, you never know. Get that out of there. But I like grab this whole loop, go around, and I do like another extrusion out of it. So like, what you can do if you do something like this? Let me see if I can. Yeah, there's not really a good option for doing this any faster. Really, I just want to grab the full edge loop. Convert to edges, convert to vertices, select faces by angle. Angle doesn't really work in this case because you're wrapped around the entire thing. Usually you just want to grab the full edge loop and most like programs will let you auto complete. But here we're just doing it by hand, unfortunately, but that's okay. So like I'd add details like hymns and stuff on here. And I want to I want to show you a little bit like what that would kind of look like. Unfortunately, <laughs> I have to I have to grab the details by hand, but I think I can do it. Just pray I don't make a mistake and like lose the selection. Cuz like I could see that happening. But I think we're going to be good. Okay. Because as soon as I hit an extrusion, we're, we're fine. Okay, so we've got something like this. So once I've got this edge loop selected, I can do like another extrusion on it. So I can extrude out. <laughs> That's a little much. Let's say like, what's point 0.1? I'll bring it back in. 0.001. 
Yeah, that's not bad. So you see we've got like this little offset like built in here. And what I can do is I could come in, let me, I'm gonna move it back a little bit. Something like that, yeah. So now what I've got is like this edge hem, you know, kind of like on here. And what I could do is I could go in and subdivide this another time. So I should have a, another subdivision level like baked into here. Mesh extrude. I'm just looking to see, it should be here somewhere. Mesh smooth right here. So I could go in and toggle that up. It's not working <laughs> because I've done other stuff to the mesh since then. So we can just go back over here to the uh, mesh smooth option and do it this way. Yeah, like this. So now if I click off of it, you see that I've kind of got this raised edge right here. That's kind of sticking out. Um, it doesn't look as hem like as I'd want it to necessarily. And part of that is because there's a big gap right here. So what I could do is I could take away that subdivision and I could go back in and I could put another hold loop right here. So this is just kind of showing you how you would go about detailing it. So like what I would do is I would grab my face tool. Let me go back to a flat view for this one. Looks like it would be under front, yeah. Go back to my front view. Can I turn the grid off? Yeah, that's a G. Stats can go away. So I can go back to my front view like this and I can find the place and I can make a cut. Another poly cut right down here. So I'll do a cut plane operation. And I'm just gonna put it like here, we'll say. Uh, the center is fine, I just need to set the rotation to zero. So we're good, and then we can collapse that. And then now if I go back, you see I have this edge loop that I can use, and I think I can just move this. Can I just select the whole thing? Yep, so that auto selects, that's nice. And I can just pull that in like that to help protect it. And then if I do the same smooth that I did earlier, we'll see, like we'll just turn this off real fast. You can see like I'm kind of getting into like the actual like process of detailing the mesh. And like it doesn't even have to stop here, right? Like I can um, go like a lot further with that. Because basically like if you look at it, like now I'm like actually starting to build up that detail. I can go back in, let me uns, uh, unsmooth my mesh, and I can put like an edge loop like around the whole thing. Um, so what that would look like is like I could take like my face selection mode and I could like, whoops, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do a whole selection again, don't worry, but like I could take like my edge selection mode right here and I could like wrap around the whole thing. I might be able to do it off. Do you have a bridge option? or no, a bridge or bevel option. Looks like it's on faces, but like I could take this and then bevel it and then like have more detail, you know, in order to hold that loop. So like basically I could go in and start adding like seams and stuff like this. Like I'm extruding this outwards, but I could also extrude inwards and create like seams and like um, overlapping pieces of fabric. So like if I had forever to detail this, like I could like detail out all the cushions, like get the um, like hems in there, seams in there. And I could go back and like really make the geometry look good. Um, if I had more time though, sometimes that time is better spent on like um, adding like bevels and stuff, or sorry, it's better spent um, adding that geometry like in the texturing phase, because like putting textures on stuff, even like that's uh, as basic as this chair model, like can really help. So like any kind of texturing, you know, for like an assignment like this, um, can look pretty good and to like give you an idea of like what like you know like a finished chair model might look like I think I had one up on my art station page I'm cheating I've actually uh I've actually modeled chairs before hold up yeah so here's something like this so like 
this is my this is my chair and let me see if I can just copy the image so I don't have to pull in my full art station info oops so I'm just grabbing something else I've done in the past and then this was not in Clara this was modeled in Maya oops but like I can just drag this over right here so like this would be the same thing with like some more time spent on it and then like like actual um, like rendering applied you know with like nice lighting and stuff so like it's a different style of chair but like you know you kind of get the idea of like where where you know you could take it to this one doesn't really have a lot of the seams because again um, like we could just add those with textures but it does show more of like the geometry and like the wheels like if I was able to push it a little further down the road so that's just like a self shout out uh, to some of my older modeling work. One second. Um, but yeah, but things like that. So it's like, I mean, chairs are just good because they uh, illustrate like a lot of hard surface properties. Like as you go, like they're still like fairly like um, well-known shapes, but like you can get like a lot of stuff with like extrusions and stuff. Like down like extrusions, subdivision modeling, like loops using polygons. So like for a hard surface, um, a hard surface modeling exercise, a hard surface being something, uh, being something that like is man-made, you know, like a man-made object as opposed to an organic one. Uh, it's got a lot of cool features that you can use and get out of it. In the, um, in the video game world, it seems like everyone wants to do like a gun, you know, for like hard surface, just because of the prevalence of guns in video games. But you know, I don't know anything about guns. Um, like and everyone else does them so I mean I'd rather tackle like a like a different exercise you know like I'd rather do something different and I like I like everyday objects like I like looking around and kind of seeing what makes up all the stuff that you know that we use every day so that's like my preference towards chairs um, in the last 10 minutes before we end the stream I just kind of wanted to think about like other parts you know, that uh, that I would use or that are like present within Clara. Uh, Clara does have some basic animation features. So I was wondering if I could like sh show that real fast. Let me clear off my edges because we don't need them for right now. But if you wanted to do like, you know, like a like a fly apart or fly in like a product, like you could you could do that inside of Clara too. It's pretty basic. You've got like a timeline down here. Let me see. You can kind of see that. Let me bring my timeline up a little bit. Yeah, there we go. So you've kind of got like your timeline down here and you can set keys on things. So I have this animation screen and I could be like a key. Oops. Just putting in my keys, hold on. So I can set a key like on this uh, X translation and like I can move this further down, move this out and then I can set another key. And then if I play my animation, you can see that like I go in reverse and like I can scale it in and out. Yeah, different kind of surfaces. So you can see that you can like create animations in Clara with like out too much work. You know, it doesn't have anything outside of like, you know, your, uh, basic like keyframe like translation rotation scale but I mean um, if that's like all you need for like a fly-in you can always do that so and it will hold your keyframes so like it's fairly robust like in what it does so like I could put something up here and let me do like a rotation I'm gonna key these real fast nope. Nope, move it over this way Okay, and then key the Y. Let's undo that. Okay, cool. So that like flies in. And then that's already locked in. So we can then do our like rotation. I'm just trying to do something crazy. Okay. that for this one we just zero it out so I'm just doing just doing a quick 
quick animation right in here and then key that but you have like you have like a lot of features in Clara you know that like you um, would expect to see like in a bigger package so let's play that oops oh oops okay weird did I take this off oh no I'm actually moving the keyframe that's weird but I just wanted to say that like you have like a lot of like different features that you would have in um, usually like a bigger package but it's all in this browser one so like and it's free to use so like just uh, create an account and kind of mess around with it because it's a pretty cool thing forward loop real time yeah player properties cool so you have like camera animation you could do with it you could do all kinds of things like if you're like baking it and then like render everything out so there's just like a lot of cool effects let me go back on here that's a bummer I feel like I deleted like off that second animation but it's fine move it up x y X, Y, Z. Hmm. Yeah, it's not setting the keyframes on 40. Anyway, nothing to get into too much right now. I'm just uh just thinking about it. There we go. So I'm just pulling something together right here. Boop, 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 boop. I've already kind of showed some of the material, like aspects of it as well. So like if you were into like, you know, texturing, you could also do that inside of Clara. And it's just easy because it just like lets you get started with it. Okay. Move this over here. And then keyframe these. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was looking for. So it looks like it's like keyed on different frames and stuff. You can kind of get the idea. Like that you can mess around with it. And then like, yeah, you can also key everything at once. That's cool. And like key it in the middle. Neat. All right, but you also have like lots of animation features inside of here. Uh, again, you have lots of texturing things, and it's got a full-fledged renderer. Keep in mind that some of the renderers, um, some of the renderers, uh, features of the renderer are locked behind a paywall. Like you have to pay more to get it. But um, but I'll, I think most of them are here, and it's fairly fairly robust. So you can use some of them, like when you're setting up and if you're looking for like a good render and something. But yeah, uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I wanted to open it up to any questions before I left, but thank you for kind of exploring Clara with me, uh, kind of seeing its viability as like a as a modeler, and kind of like what you can do with it. Um, I think it's worth mentioning again that it's completely browser based, which is I think just a big plus. Um, in learning spaces and services, we teach a lot of workshops. We do a lot of introductory work, you know, like into um, different software and different worlds. You know, and if you think about someone who's like never seen a piece of software like this before or used it in the past, it's pretty um, it's pretty great to be able to just say, hey, here's the web address, you know, make an account and just jump in and start playing around. Um, even something like Blender, which is free to use and a great piece of software. I love Blender, but it's very intimidating, like with the layout, you know, there's a lot of options. It can do so much and it's not really apparent, you know, kind of like how the interface functions when you work with it. Now the new update, you know, I think Blender 2.8 like is amazing, you know, and they've really revamped Blender as uh, Blender's interface, but at the same time, it's still like an overwhelming piece of software. So having these like web-based things where we can just drop something into the chat, like in a workshop, you know, here's a web link and let's get started. It's just a really big asset to us, you know, as educators. So we really love these pieces of software. 
Yeah, thank you for putting that link into the chat. Yeah, Clara.io. Uh, it's funny. It's funny how many things are getting the uh, .io uh, domain tag lately. I found a um, API uh, that's just all Jeopardy questions, like every Jeopardy question from like the history of the show. Not the entire history, but like I think since 1990. Like that's all housed in this API that you can just access at random. Like, so if you need to withdraw like any Jeopardy question at any point, yeah, it's all within it. But that was also like Jeopardy.io. That was the whole reason for the tangent. Yeah, it's a great way to get started. Like, and I think that's the big point with like lots of our workshops. Um, I just saw in the chat that it's a great way to get started. That if you start, you know, with this, it's a great stepping tool. And like, you can maybe pick up something more powerful. Like once you've gotten like this kind of immersion. But you know, if you want to stick with this, you can make cool stuff in it. Like absolutely. Like I hope I hope I'm kind of showcasing like what kind of tools you can use and like how you can use them to make objects. But um. But yeah, absolutely, like it's a great stepping point because anything I've done here, like I said, I could probably do in another 3D application. Um, I just have to know, like, you know, the process behind it. Like I hadn't used Claire that much at all before I started my stream, but I know what to look for. I'm like, okay, you know, I need, I need an extrude. I need um, to be able to subdivide my mesh. I need to be able to put in these edge loops, you know, to hold. Like I need to unselect or deselect, you know, I need to flip my normals and all that's inside of Clara, you know, like I found it and all those will be in any modeling package that you want to get involved with. <laughs> oh, nice. You had a stream about using it. That's really cool. I'm glad, I'm glad that I'm not the only one. Yeah. <laughs> who's uh, exploring these options. I'm assuming that you're talking about the Jeopardy API. Yeah, but it's a, uh, it is pretty funny and cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you for tuning in if you're watching this recorded. And thank you for tuning in live if you hopped in and were peeking in uh, during any point during the stream. Yep. Thank you all for joining me. I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye and check out any more of our... Yeah, exactly. Jeopardy in question. Awesome. <laughs> I really like that they, that they use the Jeopardy API. But yeah, goodbye everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, check out more of our streams and look into any of our Makerspace workshops. They're all they're all online um, on through the library's website. And thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. I always love streaming. It's great. So bye everyone. <laughs>